Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith. And listen, I'm just a girl stuck in my apartment still. Yep. And I'm looking for someone, anyone, anyone at all to talk to. So I found some people. My guest today is Jesse Bailey. Jesse's the Chief Development Officer at the Target ALS Foundation. Now, they focus on research for drug discovery and development for ALS, which is a progressive nervous system disease. So how do you continue this work? fundraising for a disease when the pandemic has just completely shifted the world's priorities. Before Jesse and I get into all of that, don't forget to like and subscribe to the Let's Talk About It YouTube channels. Don't want you missing new episodes as they come out. You'll get alerts. You'll stay on top of it, okay? So Jesse and I will wait. Go ahead, like and subscribe. Did you do it? Okay, great. Jesse, thanks so much for being here. Let's talk about it. Thank you for having me, Meredith. So for our viewers and anyone else that isn't uh, aware already, can you tell us a little bit about Target ALS? Sure. Well, we were founded in 2013 uh, by a few New Yorkers, uh, Dan Doctoroff, Michael Bloomberg, former Deputy Mayor Dan Doctoroff had a personal connection to the disease. Both his father and his uncle died of it. And when he looked at the field, what he saw was a lot of really great work happening across the country, but no one really bringing it together. Uh, no one really sort of incentivizing people to work together. You know, there's an old sort of complaint in medical research about all the silos and, and the fact that all these scientists tend to compete against each other. And so really we were born out of a very real need to bring people together uh, with the idea being that by bringing them together, we can actually accelerate the process of getting new therapies for ALS. And I think over the last uh, seven years, we've been actually successful in moving the needle and so it's sort of a proof positive of the power of collaboration. Absolutely. So take me back, if you will, to March. Where was mm -hmm. Target ALS uh, in the process of either bringing, you know, building new research, new tools for people with this disease, and then the pandemic hits and what happened <laughs> to your organization? Well, we had had a, a record-breaking year in, in 2019. We had raised a lot of money. Uh, for research, uh, and we had planned to raise even more in 2020. Um, and we had just funded a range of new collaborations looking at, uh, you know, biomarker research, the overlap between ALS and certain forms of dementia. And so there was really a certain momentum that was building. Uh, and we, we, actually, we actually worked right up until closure. Uh, and it was like everyone else in this field being hit by, a, a, you know, a ton of bricks. And so after you kind of get up and dust yourself off, the question is, what, will you succumb to this situation or will you, will you respond to it? Will you rise and try to meet the moment? And I think the question for everybody in this field is, um, you know, and you, you think of this in terms of just, uh, as, you, as, as we discussed earlier, sort of COVID-related charities. But the truth is that, that this question of what we're doing during the pandemic applies to everyone. And what supporters want to know is, are you continuing to do the mission? Are you continuing to advance the mission of your organization despite these troubling times? So the best possible uh, appeal you can make as a fundraiser is not to say, we're going to go out of business tomorrow unless you give us money. It's not necessarily to say uh, that the world is ending. I think that the best response, and I think we've certainly done this, is to say, listen, these are hard times, but our work continues. And in fact, that was sort of the slogan that we coined for the agenda that we, were, we would continue to implement at Target ALS, which is our work continues. Mm -hmm. We want to be as supportive to you know, researchers who are advancing COVID therapies as possible. Our focus needs to continue to be on bringing scientists together to do that work. What that means is figuring out how to encourage collaboration remotely, how to try to give grant money when literally the universities of high, and the, the institutions of higher education aren't even open. How do you get people to move on research when so much is shut down? And I think it's constant troubleshooting. And I think it's about staying dedicated. And I think it's about communicating to supporters that uh, the work continues. Mm -hmm. So did the research, the fundraising, the work, as you've said, for ALS, mm -hmm. they have to take a back seat in order for you to be able to contribute to research 
fundraising for COVID in order to be able to get back to the normal research. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, because it... Right, I hear you. Well, we stayed, you know, absolutely focused on supporting ALS researchers uh, and continuing to develop new ways to support them. So we provide uh, direct funding to collaborations. So there may be a researcher at uh, in Boston, in San Francisco, and in Texas who all have this similar idea. We bring them together, we provide them with funding, uh, and we also provide them with tools and resources. So there's a ton of things that scientists need to do their research that you would think they would have access to, but they actually don't. And so we provide those things to them, basic uh, materials to conduct experiments, you know, sort of high level genomic analysis. And so there was a real need to make sure that we continued that job during this pandemic. And you know, what we found was that so many organizations in our, in our field actually had to sort of take a break and focus on just raising the bare minimum amount of money to stay open. And what we did was we said, okay, operationally, how can we just make, how can we reduce cost uh, so that more money can go out to research and how can we try to maintain focus? And so, you know, we, for example, we had physical offices in Manhattan. Um, and uh, although, you know, we all want to be supportive of New York, we had to make the decision to put patients first. And so it saved some money. Uh, and we found little ways to, to reduce operational costs. Uh, and then we focused on how do we push that out to uh, and fund the research agenda. So is the office no more for right now? We are all virtual. Uh, and, uh, and we, you know, honestly, I think... Um, well, long bad. term, welcome to my office. Yeah, right. long term, it may cause some issues with uh, my back. I think what we've found is that um, you know we, we, we're more efficient. You know, we just do more when we're more focused. Obviously, we miss each other. Uh, uh, the team misses each other, but we're we're on Zoom constantly, and sometimes it feels like we talk to them more than we did when they were you know in the office next door. Um, but you know, th those decisions were made obviously to protect people in the office but also just with the idea of uh, trying to be creative, as creative as possible in terms of, of, of continuing to fund the research agenda when so many other organizations in our, in our uh, field had to take that break, right? And I'm most proud of the fact that we continue to invest in research collaborations. We continue to um, you know, communicate with our, with our teams on the ground across the country who are working on ALS to get the job done. Uh, and I think what you're going to see is that while the actual uh, closure of these labs, you know, obviously would slow down some of the momentum that we were able to do quite a bit and that, um, you know, we will have accelerated ALS research even further this year. So, yeah, that's what I was just thinking. Even as hard as it must have been to continue to fundraise and advocate for research, you can't you can only do so much. The world is shut down. How does research continue, even if you're able to support it? Right, right. It's it's a big issue. I mean, I'm, so I think it was about sort of taking a step back and thinking about what needs to get done. How can you prioritize? So, so a lot of research is about building these relationships. It's about uh, encouraging communication. It's about thinking about what your plan is, right? How are you gonna get the research done? So a lot of what we did is actually continue those conversations so that the minute the labs open, we could launch our new initiatives and get the work done. Uh, and a lot of it actually can be done from home, but you know we won't tell everybody that, but we were able to get a lot done from home and so were our scientists. And we're, we're extremely proud of them and we're proud of the, the work that's, that's been done so far. So research is, is, is continuing. Mm -hmm. How much or how long of a period were you would you say you were set back during the shutdown? That life couldn't go on as normal and research couldn't happen, even as you are rebuilding and recuperating and, and eventually we'll get to a point where even more uh, was accomplished this year than hopefully you had expected, especially in light of the pandemic. But was is how long were things so I think that that there, you know, it's as it's as long as there was the 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 full shutdown in the spring. I think is what we're talking about. I think what we was was absolutely necessary to do during that period is to be able to communicate that we have, we're good. We have a great, you know, we get received great funding the previous year. We we're able to continue all of our research grants. We we're able to do more. We issued more grants because the issuance of those grants, the communication of the scientists can help ensure that they can continue once it's over, right? So just like everybody else, it's not just the nonprofit sector, but scientists, 
you know, folks across different sectors have to worry about what's going to happen after this pandemic is over, or what's going to happen, you know, post shutdown. And so we just, we didn't skip a beat. We were, you know, we, there was a closure on Friday. We were all at work on Monday virtually uh, working to make sure that our scientists could push out the research. But, you know, unfortunately, it's just a result of the pandemic. There'll always, there'll be a few months of sort of delay of experiments that couldn't happen, of patients that couldn't, have, couldn't be seen because of, because of this. And um, it is unfortunate. Now, from a fundraising standpoint or just the outreach for support, did you ever receive any backlash going to those donors or pushback, if not backlash, that there's a pandemic happening, the world is shut down, <laughs> people are dying uh, from <laughs> the coronavirus, you want me to support you guys now? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a big question. I think that that we were sensitive. We we are sensitive to that uh, the priorities of the country, and I think that uh, there's no you know we share a desire to see this thing you know be put in the rearview mirror. So I think it's having those honest conversations with people. I prefer to do it one on one, you know, over Zoom when possible. But I think that in what we write and how we communicate the tone of what we say. We have to be very clear with people that we understand this is a priority. We encourage, you know, in some cases, you know, you know, you have to encourage people to do what they believe is good, but that for many of these folks that we talked to, they've been personally impacted by ALS. Yeah. We've see, seen someone basically uh, be suffocated to death by the disease, right? Right before their eyes and nothing they can do. There, there are no treatments that are effective. And that it remains a, 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 a reality. And so as long as that remains a reality, we have to remain committed to doing our work. And so I think people can understand, you know, and I think if the tone is correct and if it's about respecting people who are in those situations and trying to do right by them, uh, I think at the end of the day, the vast majority of people were extremely um, uh, understanding and respected what we needed to do. Uh, now, of course, it sounds like you are keeping people who are suffering with this disease at front of mind. But have you been able to stay in touch with anyone living with this disease, suffering from it? Anyone ha Has there been a sentiment or communication that like we feel forgotten at this time because priorities and focus is elsewhere right now? It's, you know, it's, 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 it is interesting. I think that, that there's not a day that goes by that we don't hear about somebody who's been impacted by this, either a new diagnosis that someone I found out the day that I knew a year ago, I, I had, I met him in Wyoming, uh, is a, just a tremendous human being. He, I, I didn't realize the disease would take him so quickly. And he, he passed a couple of weeks ago. I found out about it earlier today. Um, you know, you find out about people diagnosed, you find out about people who pass. Um, I think that they, themselves are understanding um, uh, of the fact that this is going on. I think they are frustrated. And I think that that's why you have to continue just to do the work. And it goes for all disease, diseases and disease areas, right? There is a need to continue to advance your mission during these times because uh, we have people out there who are in pain, uh, people out there who are needlessly suffering and we have to do what we can to support them. And I have to tell you, there's not a single person I've met with this disease who wasn't incredibly courageous, who didn't step up to the moment, um, you know, facing this daunting challenge of, of, of a rap, potentially a rapid decline with grace and humility and courage. And so that's kind of what keeps you going. And I think that that's what kind of fuels the, the messaging and, and how you reach out to people. Um, that's what inspired, you know, this partnership with Spartan, which we formed a couple months ago. Um, that's what that's what does stay in front of mind. And I think they have been very understanding of where we're at and very, you know, sort of glad that we're continuing to do the work. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the partnership with Spartan. Well, it really stemmed out of the fact that that you, you know, I think the couple principles coming out of the pandemic was to make sure you're constantly communicating the vision of your organization what you want to do. And so when a COVID crisis happens, that means you have to communicate how you're reacting to it, right? So we, we coined this term, our work continues, and we sought to communicate to donors that we needed to, to continue to receive funding. Uh, but then you also have to get creative and you have to find new ways to engage people on where they're at. Uh, 
and you have to find new ways to sort of pool resources across across the community. And so inspired by the patients that we've met who struggle with this disease every day, um, quote unquote, the hardest fight, um, we wanted to put together a challenge that would allow people to sort of uh, fight for them, um, you know, with a health and wellness um, frame. And so we created the toughest challenge for the hardest fight, uh, a campaign powered by Spartan races. Of course, they do all those crazy obstacles, right, that, that, that I didn't even think I could do until I started training. And then I, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty daunting uh, task, but it's actually quite fun to do. Um, and so, you know, it just inspired by the notion that um, we all need to challenge ourselves to, to do better and to do more in order, in, in order to help people who are in, in the hardest fight and then to honor them and to, to make sure we can develop therapies even faster. Now, I've seen from a, a very far away distance what Spartan challenges look like. Like I'm on the couch and I see it depicted on <laughs> right, of a right. distance because um, I, I don't think I would survive one of those. But <laughs> what I see are big groups of people getting together for a race. How do right. you do that during a pandemic where social distance is, is, so, you know, how do you have a race? It, 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 it's a great point. You remember when, and at some point, you remember in, in March when this shut down and everybody started to plan stuff for September uh, and August, right? August to September, thinking that at some point, you know, this is going to be over and we can keep going. And then as we got to July, people are excited about Thanksgiving. And now we're just, you know, excited about 2027, right? But so I think that- 2027. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. So I, I think that that, I think that that's, you know, part of, part, was definitely a setback, it was just trying to wrap your head around how, how long this crisis was gonna last. And so at some point over the summer, we realized that this, we really did need to make this virtual. And so this year's toughest challenge is really done from the comfort of your own home. Uh, there was a funny video of one of our researchers actually doing uh, exercises. I think his lifting his dog up and, and doing uh, exercises from his living room. Um, but it, it, it's a fun way to build camaraderie, to lose the COVID-15. Um, we're, we, you know, Spartan Races is doing this big virtual race on November 6th to the 8th. The, I think it's the first um, world championship, um, you know, that's done virtually, right? And the idea is for people of all fitness levels to be able to engage in some fitness activity. You know, our, our take on that is that you can basically create a fun challenge for yourself um, so that it's more about you and your personal fitness and what you could do to try to, uh, to try to you know, um, raise awareness and support for, for ALS patients, right? And so, you know, on November 6th through the 8th of this year, we're all gonna be getting together, uh, you know, virtually, thank you, virtually, um, from the comfort of our own homes um, and, and engaging in that fitness, keeping, keeping all the patients and the loved ones and the caregivers that we know in mind. Okay, despite me hating everything COVID uh, changed right now, this, this has some appeal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it it's like gotten, kind of race. It's gotten us moving. Uh, my husband and I are, you know, working out in the mornings now. And I, I didn't think I could actually, uh, we, we would actually uh, work well together working out. You know, I, I don't know if we were that couple uh, that, that you find running every morning, but we've become that couple fully, you know, in Scott, you know, encased in a mask and hat and, um, but- Those people are in you. <laughs> we, we are now those people. Didn't think that was gonna happen, but it's, it's been an experience to get training for this. And I, I do think that that, um, the whole thing is just, a, it's, it's been a transformative experience to see patients step up and, and hear their stories and find out why they're taking on the toughest challenge. Uh, and I think I'm supposed to say toughestchallenge.com um, to make sure people go to the site and check it out. But it really is about, uh, uh, and, and so, so I just, I just want to circle back to a point earlier, which is that when you think about how to confront something like this pandemic, you do have to get creative. You have to find new ways to engage people on where they're at. And we all are suffering some amount of fatigue, anxiety. You know, it's, you know, it's November 2nd, right? So there's a lot of anxiety out there. Anything we can do to project positivity um, and to inspire people and to remind people of, of what's happening for ALS patients every day. Yeah. I think that's a good thing. 
Uh, and, and the other part is I think oftentimes we tend to focus on um, the negative aspects of someone suffering from a terminal illness. And, and, and obviously there is, you know, it, uh, obviously it, it's tragic, but there's a, it's also incredibly heroic and it's also incredibly inspiring. And so it, it's about sort of unlocking that inspiration. And so when we do the race on the 6th or the 8th, we're going to be thinking about my friend from Wyoming who passed away a few weeks ago and all the friends that we've met have passed and who are uh, suffering from the disease now. And so it'll be an emotional workout, uh, but one that we're uh, excited to, to do. So what will your race and other people's races look like? It's, it's all individualized? So it, so they do have a, you know, the Spartans have a, a, a sort of a couple different levels. They have sort of an entry level where you do like a 5K, so a couple okay. miles. You run, walk it, and then you do a couple sort of indoor exercises, some squats, some sit-ups, some push-ups. Uh, all that can be found at toughestchallenge.com. Uh, but you also, um, and, and so, so you can customize it a bit. We're going to leave the apartment. We're going to run around the building uh, until we hit the, the 5K part. We're going to race up the stairs. We're going to do the exercises from the apartment. Um, so it's been fun to see how you customize um, that a bit and how we're going to sort of try to, try to embrace our surroundings, um, right? While maintaining social distance because I, I live in Connecticut now and we're phase two. Um, so we wanna make sure we're good, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a chance to get personally creative on how you're gonna do it. But most of it can, is, is, can be done from the apartment or your house or your yard. And that's what's cool, right? So you don't actually have to, um, you don't have to go very far to help a lot of people. Oh, that's very inspiring. Um, is there a goal, a fundraising goal? With, uh, yeah, so we're, we're hoping to raise $100,000, which will go to supporting uh, biomarker research. Uh, one of the things that is really tragic about ALS is that it's not diagnosed until the disease is fairly advanced. Uh, and by the time you can see it, which is when it's diagnosed, it's already ravaged the body in many ways. Uh, and so uh, we have to find a way to diagnose the disease early. Uh, and then to track its progression over time so we can, you know, better direct clinical trials and um, better develop uh, novel therapeutics. And so the money is going to be going to support uh, some really promising projects, um, really promising um, groups of scientists, or excuse me, groups of scientists that are working on some really promising ideas. So the, what's great about this is that folks will be able to see the impact they make you know, almost immediately in terms of knowing the scientists that they're supporting and in terms of seeing the, that research advance. That's incredible. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for talking to me about how the work continues and how Target ALS is very much at 100% uh, go mode to continue fundraising and continue finding ways to research for this disease. Meredith, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. And people should go to toughestchallenge.com uh, and it's uh, targetals.org. So thanks. Excellent. Well, Jesse, thank you again for being here. This has been Let's Talk About It. We'll talk to you next time.